A big warm welcome to you all on behalf of HeartEdge, who are hosting this meeting today with Jesus Shaped People. And uh, I'm Northwest Coordinator of HeartEdge, and uh, I've uh, a little bit of experience of JSP. Um, we ended up not doing it at my church. You can ask me the story sometime, but I think it's a jolly good thing. So um, I'm going to hand over to Brendan, but I'm going to talk for a moment because there are still people arriving. And so we want to give people a moment longer to arrive. Um, just to say, uh, I think Brendan will be inviting you to use the chat. Do make use of the, the chat function. Uh, do keep yourselves muted because it just makes everything a lot better on Zoom if you're muted, um, except when you're speaking. And um, also, we're going to record today. So we'll record in speaker view, so you shouldn't appear on any videos. Uh, but if you're nervous of doing that, you know, you can mute your video or um, change your name to Archbishop of Canterbury or something if you want. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't encourage that, obviously. Um, so I think uh, there's a lovely group of you here. I'm going to hand over to Brendan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andy and uh, Ben and the guys at Heart, everyone at Heart Edge. Uh, and thank you to all of you for joining uh, with us today in what we hope and pray will be a stimulating and encouraging conversation uh, around reshaping discipleship in the COVID and post-COVID uh, era. So many thanks to all of you for coming on. Let me just reiterate that this is a conversation and the, the chat it will be open and we welcome your comments and questions and reflections as we're going along. Massive thanks to our panel of practitioners and leaders who are here today and um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves uh, first of all and just just to get us going, to kick us off, to maybe ask them all if they've got a favourite metaphor that describes discipleship. And it doesn't matter if we've got two the same, that would be okay, or three the same. So perhaps we could start off with, perhaps Graham, could you could you just say hello and um, tell us a little bit about yourself and if you have a favourite metaphor for discipleship? Yeah, uh, my name's Graham Potter. I'm team vicar and estates pioneer in the parish of Keithley in West Yorkshire. Um, all my metaphors tend to be football related, <laughs> um, which isn't always a good thing. <laughs> but my, I, I guess my um, metaphor would be about hope, the hope that discipleship brings. It's like that first day of the football season at three o'clock, everybody has played none, won none, lost none, drawn none, have got no goals for or against, and every football supporter is thinking it's this year it's that sense of hope and uh i guess that's my my metaphor for discipleship that hope that we bring um as we learn more about jesus yeah yeah thank you thank you graham and i won't and i won't well maybe the, the, the retort to that is often in the football world especially in august when you've lost your first three games it's the hope that kills you that's right <laughs> quarter past three that first weekend there are a load of people who know not this year Okay, thank you. Um, Martin, welcome. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, I was trying to do it from the perspective of our, our church since JSP, and it's it's cake. Um, it's all about hospitality for us, really reaching out into the community. Um, and, you know, the first disciples, it was all about fishing and things, but in our community, it's all about cake and hospitality. Mm. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, Mervyn. Oh, right, hello, I, I, I was, was muted and now I'm not. Um, uh, my name's Mervyn Flecknow, uh, I'm a dissenter, uh, being a Methodist and not an Anglican, uh, which I don't regard this as a handicap in any way. Uh, I suppose my metaphor would be that lovely Buddhist parable about the man fleeing from a tiger 
by descending a cliff only to find out that there's a tiger at the bottom of the cliff as well and that the vine to which he's hanging on by one hand is being gnawed by a couple of mice and he looks over to the right and sees a strawberry growing in the cliff and he reaches out and picks it and puts it in his mouth and says mmm delicious <laughs> Uh, so, you know, uh, making, making the most of what we've got now and, uh, and uh, not worrying, not worrying, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. And could you just say a bit, of, Mervyn, about your, your, your church, your situation where you're based, please? Right, okay. Uh, Methodist Church in Bailden, uh, we've got about... Um, we had about 190 members at the beginning of COVID and we've now got about 160. Um, and uh, we're convening meetings. We've got three con consecutive uh, concurrent meetings about how we are to reopen and, and how different we will be when we reopen. So we've got a group of young people discussing, we've got a group of families discussing, and we've got a group of old fogies discussing. Mm. Uh, other people, uh, established members, established members discussing, and some wonderful ideas are coming out. And we would not have been able to do that had we not been practicing the Jesus shaped people model for the last six, seven years. Excellent. Thank you, Mervyn. Thank you. And of course, it's John Wesley Memorial Day today as well, isn't it? Well, what a chap. <laughs> Thank you, Mervyn. Thank you. Um, Dawn, Dawn Savage, please say hello. I don't know how I can follow Mervyn. That's crazy. So <laughs> my my name is Dawn. I am the uh, National Children and Young People Advisor for Jesus Shaped People. I've been doing that for almost four years already. Uh, and all my metaphors do not involve football because I try not to watch too much, even though both my sons play. Uh, mine always <laughs> involves children and young people. So I think mine is definitely that, that beautiful picture of the love between a child and a parent when they just can't get enough and they just love to be in relationship and love to spend time together. Can you remember that feeling as a parent in lockdown 1.0 when we were so excited to spend so much time with our children and now in lockdown 3.0 <laughs> we are so excited for them to go back to school. <laughs> So definitely, it's that beautiful relationship that a parent and a child have. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dawn. Thank you. And um, and Gordon. Hello, hi. Uh, I'm Gordon Day, and I'm a, a regional coordinator for Jesus Shaped People uh, here in Leeds. I've been part of it, though, from very early days. It was in my parish uh, in Bradford that uh, Jesus Shaped People emerged uh, many years ago now. Um, and it's a delight now to stay on board with this and uh, to see things uh, growing. Um, my um, image or metaphor, um, well, I've got five musical sons and um, they are uh, wonderful the way they produce music. So uh, my metaphor is an orchestra, really. When, mm -hmm. um, when, they, uh, when I retired uh, 10 years ago, uh, they bought me a cello. And I, since then, I've been looking to play the cello and hoping that at some point I might be good enough to join an orchestra because there's something about an orchestra that brings people together, creates something very beautiful, creates a language that's different uh, and, and, and overcomes all barriers, uh, whatever. I love that East-West Divan Orchestra. You probably know if Daniel Bowenboim has. The way that music and, and an orchestra can gather people together and play a very different music that's terribly important for our world. Uh, and the conductor who kind of enables everybody to function and bring their different bits to all of that. So that's my image, yeah, Ben. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Gordon. We're, we're gonna come back to Gordon in, uh, in a minute. Of course, Gordon, if you're not aware, Gordon's the, 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 the founder of, of JSP and he received the, the vision from it, from his own personal experience. And he, he's, he's gonna to talk to us in a moment about that. Let me just say a few words of introduction around the topic today. I, th I suppose the, the two areas we're going to cover and weave JSP principles and practices into it is what we mean by a discipleship. And also of course the, the, the impact that COVID-19 and its eventual legacy, which is something I'm particularly interested in, is gonna have on our understanding of the practice 
of discipleship. And I, and I hope and pray that um, what you hear about JSP today also, and, and what we, we believe positively offers something that explores particularly the relationship between theory and practice in the world of discipleship. Um, Jesus clearly spoke uh, in very stark terms about discipleship. The last thing he said to the disciples was go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, of course. And there's been a huge amount of books uh, now written around the whole area of, of theory and, and practice. It is one of the great jargon words, isn't it, in the Christian church. We don't typically hear the word discipleship very much outside of church circles. It does it does exist, but we don't always think a lot uh, of it when we're outside. The language of discipleship is not a language that everyone is comfortable with, with but there, I think there are some, some, some things that we can bring it down to that will make a lot of sense to a lot of people. I love Rowan Williams' uh, definition, his very simple definition in his 2016 uh, book, Being Disciples, when, he, when he, he described discipleship as staying with and following Jesus, staying with and following Jesus. A good place to start, I would suggest, or I often used to say, in uh, my congregations uh, and pray for them and pray for all of us that we would become a little bit more like Jesus. A little bit more like Jesus. So today I think what we'll unpack a little bit around is, is how we help people not to just gather information but how we live in the realm of discipleship. When I was a new Christian, people the, the, the main way that people tried to disciple me was to say, go and buy this book. Buy that book. Have you ever heard of this book or this author? It was always about books, which is fine, but that's not the whole story in the world of discipleship. And I've been pleased to encounter around the world Christian leaders who are illiterate or semi-literate. And they're doing a great job. They've never heard of Augustine. They've never heard of Karl Barth. They've never heard of John Calvin. But they're doing it. They're doing the work of being disciples and helping other people to be disciples too. Um, I just wanted, before I hand over to Gordon, I wanted to just share a quote from, um, let me share the screen a minute, because I think this is quite a profound comment. And I think it fits in, it'll link us very nicely towards um, what Gordon can begin to share about the, the story of Jesus shaped people. At, at, at JSP, I think our, one of our, our, our key emphasis is, is, is the whole church discipleship. And Leslie Newbegin famously said that the only possible hermeneutic of the gospel is the congregation which actually believes it. In other words, uh, who believes it and lives out its implications together, together as a community, and brings the Christian story, the gospel to life and puts flesh uh, on, on the bones. And that was one of the reasons why I was so interested in uh, taking up my role as the, the team leader of JSP and helping to contribute and build on everything that my very dear friend Gordon Day has achieved and done in Christ and for Christ through this, this work. Now I'm going to hand over to Gordon at this point, who will tell us uh, something of the JSP story, if you're not familiar uh, with it. Gordon, over to you. Thanks, ever so. Um, do I do something to fill the screen, or do I, um, what, what happens? Do you, have you still, ah, there we are. How, how do I take over the full screen there, Ben? What do I do? Oh, you're, you're on speaker view now. We can see you. I am doing. Oh, that's good. Okay. Good. It's not appearing like that for me. Um, so what, what, thanks uh, very much, Brendan, and, and great now to have that opportunity just to tell a little bit of the background story uh, to this. Um, I, I've been ordained this year 50 years, and the whole of those 50 years have been spent largely focused on working in large urban estates in West Yorkshire, in Huddersfield, in Halifax, and in Bradford. And really that um, conviction about the need for Jesus-shaped people sprang out of that ministry. 
um, it really sprang from three particular convictions. Uh, the first is that conviction that Ben has already spoken about, how the, the simple understanding of discipleship we need springs from that simple command of Jesus to follow me. Uh, the question is, what does that mean? I'll come to that in a moment. Secondly, it springs from a conviction that, that Jesus is with us now and that his Holy Spirit is at work. And so anything that we do is not so much what we do, but what he does through us. So that conviction that Jesus wants to continue his work not only by calling us to follow him, but by invigorating us by his spirit to do that is the second. Uh, and the third conviction is that this is actually the only work of the church. It's the only authentic work that churches ought to be about. Our simple command to follow him, it's not to be one command amongst many other things. That's what we are doing as Christians. That's our work. So let's just have a little think about that follow me thing and what quite what it means. And uh, in, in the early beginnings of Jesus Shed People, I came to a new understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, and that's now embedded in the root core principles of Jesus Shaped People. And it springs out of looking again at the life of Jesus and understanding what he made to be important. These were the convictions he had. These are the things that sprang out of what he believed he was here to do. Uh, and, and, and let's just quickly remind ourselves of those, those five core things. First of all, he was a people person. He showed very little interest in buildings. The only building he was interested in at all was the temple. And that was only because he had to tell everybody it was coming down. So that whole business of buildings was not ever something that took over his life. Um, Secondly, he was a teacher and he taught through stories. He didn't teach through books. He didn't teach through rote learning. He taught through stories of things that were happening where he could show people how God was at work in different situations. And he urged people to learn from the stories, from the events uh, of all of that. And essentially it led to him giving people a grasp of, of, of an upside down, inside out type of ministry, something so contrasting to what they normally saw operating in the life of our world. Thirdly, he was a great team builder and he was heavily committed to the training of a group of ordinary men and women who traveled with him and were reshaped by him. So he had a huge commitment to a core group of people for that. Fourthly, he made prayer extraordinarily important, particularly at key points in his ministry, and sometimes for very lengthy periods. He needed to spend long, lengthy periods with his father to ensure that he was on track and always being renewed. If sometimes that was at the beginning, uh, in the desert or in the Galilean hills or in the Mount of Olives in the final week. And finally, he made prophecy a key strand to his ministry. Um, he spoke the truth fearlessly uh, and uncompromisingly, particularly to those of his own faith background. And of course, that led to him having uh, the, the impact on him uh, was, uh, was, uh, is all that we know it was. Having seen Jesus shaped people impact in our church as those five core principles started to uh, grow and become accepted. After I retired from uh, public ministry, the Diocese of Bradford invited me to see whether other churches could benefit from that experience. And so eight years ago, five churches also serving large urban estates uh, were the earliest recipients of that experience. They were followed by steady growth of churches, first of all in our local area, but then as that spilled over into other places, even to Manchester, goodness me, uh, then uh, you know we, we, we were realized that we had something uh, that was really quite important, as long as we maintained those core principles. And since then, that's continued to grow. Uh, all sorts of things have happened. A charitable trust was formed five years ago or more. Uh, we found the resources to appoint people like Brendan and Dawn and, and so on. It's been great to have them uh, leading now uh, Jesus Shaped People. And more recently, we found new conviction through sensing that this is a period over this last year uh, in which, through which God wants to speak to us and, and make us alert to his spirit. So we have a program called Stay Alert to the Spirit that you'll be hearing a little bit more about uh, that, is a, that sprung out of the conviction that God wants to use this period 
uh, in, in a very special way. So it's an unusual tale of how a resource that's now spreading across the UK and being used in a wide spectrum of churches. Jesus Church people is extremely non-tribal now. Uh, there is no uh, loyalty to any particular denomination. Uh, we believe that's not a Jesus Church thing to do, uh, and we need to sustain that uh, all the time. Uh, today, we've got three uh, ministers who are going to be sharing their experience uh, of Jesus Church people from very different backgrounds uh, and from different denominations too. And it's great that um, having had an Anglican background, Brendan who springs from a more Baptist one, you know, now is our team leader these days. So it's time just to give them a chance just to say a little bit about their experience of Jesus Church people. And I'm going to begin with inviting Graham, uh, Graham Potter, who's uh, already spoken to us uh, with his uh, favourite uh, metaphor. He's going to tell us a little bit about how Jesus Church people impacted uh, a year or two ago in Keithley. So over to you, Graham. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. Um, Keithley, if I give you some background of what the parish is like first of all that will give you uh, some context really. Um, Keithley is what, what is now being called by our bishops a super parish in that the, we have three uh, full-time stipendary clergy and we all have a church to look after and another job. Um, my other job is estates pioneer, we've got a town chaplain and uh, a team rector. So we're trying to remove all the boundaries within the churches as we work, find ways to work together. And when we started planning the Jesus Shaped People um, program, we also invited our neighbouring parish in as well. Key to JSP for us was the small groups meeting midweek and not just doing this on a Sunday. So we found ways of uh, developing small groups that anybody from any of the churches would join in with, um, whether it was the time of day that they were available, whether it was an age group that they were more comfortable with. Um, it was, let's just not be tribal about this within the parish. Uh, so some of my, my people from my church, which were on one edge of Keithley up a hill, um, they just, went down and joined one of the other groups that was set up during the week when it was convenient for them and rather than having I don't know three or four different groups in one church with hardly anybody coming uh, we we had really good robust groups of people where they could uh, work through this material those groups would have kept going now we did JSP in the autumn of 2019 so we, we've sort of had our legs cut from under us. Um, what I did at St Barnabas was uh, worked with the youth group, the youth from across the parish. We, we'd got a number of fringe youth contacts that we were working with. And I sort of pulled them all together and said, look, let, why don't we do this program together? And so for the, the 15 weeks we were giving them pizza in my lounge at, on a Sunday evening and we'd work through together the JSP material um, and it sort of merged into a confirmation baptism class in the new year of 2020. Um, they wanted to keep meeting together, they, they, they wanted to develop their faith and this was the outworking of what, what was next on their faith journey. Um, Another group I was working with were uh, in the town centre who had formed a Bible study group after responding to uh, a CAP, Christians Against Poverty, social evening where someone had given their testimony and this fledgling Bible study group had come out of that. So we were working with that group as well. And Delivery style is different, very much conversational as we're working through this. And what we've tried to do moving forward through COVID is find, keep that ethos of, right, so how do people engage? Don't be tribal about this is my church, so you come to whatever that church has put on. So the way that has manifested itself is the online presence for the churches across the parish are all completely different. 
we've got a very traditional service from Jonathan's church all saints that you would recognize as sort of traditional Anglicanism if you like there's something a little more modern from uh, Mike Cansdale team rector from his church in the center of town and what what I've done is to do something more outreachy so it looks almost like a a bible week if you like that sort of this is this is who jesus is type bible week so we've kept those differences and not duplicated but allowed people from across the parishes to to engage in different ways um with with what the material has been and for my youth group they were really keen to be out to actually do something practical for their in their community um, so even within lockdown we've we've adopted uh, a couple of snickets through the the um, area here that um, get full of leaf rubbish that turns into mud and dog mess and all sorts and every couple of months we'll go out and we'll give it a good clean and then we'll eat pizza together so it, it's had some real good practical ways that we've been able to keep this group together when we were each of the churches planning um, the teaching the Sunday teaching material we said right who can we bring in to a preaching team across the parish who need who doesn't get a, the, the opportunity to preach very often because they've got a lot of people in that church how do we share that resource round and so we had all sorts of people who'd never preached in other people's churches um, coming along and, and preaching in the context of of the church and it's a great way to get the archdeacon invited and as well if you've got one or, or whatever your denominational equivalent is um is there anything else i was going to say yeah so we've talked about team the midway group was key i think i'll probably stop there and we can well, i i was just gonna that's brilliant thank you i was just gonna ask you a sort of follow-up question i mean JSP is not in reinventing anything particularly, but it's a process and a tool and a method. If you had to summarise in a sentence, perhaps the impact it's had on, you know, the congregations that you're involved in, in your your team ministry, how would you how would you summarise it in a sentence? Um, I think what it did for us, and because this is very pertinent to our context, is that we needed to find ways for the churches to become a single unit and as a parish and finding the ways to get to swap resource sources to share resources to be comfortable with people from our churches going to somebody else's home group and not feeling that they're going to go to a different church it it really brought a a unity within our churches across the parish that we were well it's what we wanted it was yeah, that so it was a breaking down of barriers and yes yeah, yeah. which yeah Thank you. And, Thank and you know, uh, styles of worship, you know, so my elderly 90 year old pianist was mm -hmm. in a group with people of a completely different churchmanship than yep. him. And they still got on together. They still worked uh, really well together. That, and that it was that starting to actually form the parish as a parish. Yep rather than four individual churches yeah which was which is really emphasizing the the, the whole church obviously yes. you're involved in a team and it's just that whole church discipleship exactly. that's, that's, yeah. that's brilliant okay graham well thank you so much we can come back to your experience later on in the um in the in the other reflections but um mervyn can can we can we ask you to um share a little bit about what happened when your church used jesus shaped people resources and methods You're, you're muted, uh, Mervyn. Okay, I've got five minutes. I've just started my phone. Um, we started JSP in 2014. And uh, since then, every year, we've had at least one and sometimes two series, study series. Now, Gordon calls them challenges or adventures. Um, we haven't quite got into that yet. Uh, but the idea of telling the preachers what they've got to preach about has been one of the innovations. It's been good. Um, the second thing is we had 
a, a small but vocal and very influential group of people in the church who describe themselves as Bible based Christians, while still incredibly eating prawn cocktail and lobster thermidor, despite all the rude things that Leviticus says about it, um, because they picked the bits that they wanted and then were quite definite about this was what we had to do as a church. Um, and amazingly, their confidence uh, uh, extended to lots of spheres in which Jesus was silent, like abortion and gay marriage. And um, uh, we've we've learned to concentrate on the imitation of Christ, if I can use that that phrase. Um, it's quite clear when you do that, that Jesus was uncertain about his mission from time to time. Why else would he spend all that time up mountains? Uh, I teach navigation and, and mountain leadership. And one of the things that you do as a leader is to keep checking your compass because you can go wrong. And checking your compass doesn't mean to say that you're an inadequate leader. It means that you're taking care of the, of the party. You're checking the way. And that's my interpretation of Jesus' retreat into, pe into, into prayer. He also changed his mind. Um, and th that came as a real surprise to us. Gosh, Jesus changed his mind. Yes, he was going to the the, the uh, uh, Jews and, and then suddenly he went off to the Gentiles. Why did he do that? Because he was talking to a woman. And um, and thank you, Gordon, for that. Esther. I love you. Um, and uh, so all this this checking and what it's done for our, con our congregation, because after every JSP type service, and incidentally, we renamed Stay Alive in the Spirit uh, so that we can abbreviate it to saints instead of sats, for crying out loud. Sats. <laughs> How to get the entire educational establishment down your back. Um, uh, we, we've given the congregation the confidence to discuss because we kind of removed theology from, you know, uh, people aren't really willing to discuss in church because they're going to be wrong, aren't they? Because because there's going to be some theologian there. Um, philosophers philosophers describe black cats in coal cellars. Theologians describe black cats that have left the coal cellar and are no longer even there to be stroked. Um, there's not theology in this. There's just Jesus and, and, and the, the example and principle of Jesus. I've got one minute and 10 seconds left. Uh, so we've not only done a series based on JSP, but we've also instituted our own. And, uh, and that's been very useful. We've, we've uh, uh, just finished one Christian values. What are the Christian values that we need to do uh, to, to concentrate on? And our interpretation of Jesus and neighbours. Who is my neighbour? And Jesus showed that his neighbours were everyone. Lots of people who proper Jews wouldn't associate with. They were Jesus' neighbours. And children, particularly. Children. Why children? Because they're the future. And uh, this enables us to concentrate on our ecological work of saying what are our responsibilities to the children of our great-grandchildren they are our neighbors what sort of world are they going to in inhabit and um and so through directly looking at the life of jesus and peripherally looking at what that spirit tells us to do um jsp has just been the most wonderful thing and uh uh, I, uh, I I thank God for that uh, conversation on Gordon Day City in 2013 that led us into this mess. Yeah, thanks, God. Well, that's it's a, it was a, it's an anointed city. Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, Mervyn, yeah, thanks for that. I mean, clearly, you particularly emphasise questioning uh, stuff, which which does create, a, 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 I think, a spirit of creativity, doesn't it? But it, like I asked Graham, I mean, if if in a, could you summarise in a sentence the impact it's made on Belden 
Methodist Church. You know, you using not JSP per se, but the, you know the the method and the and the priorities and the emphasis. How would you summarise it in a sentence? We've got services to address issues that affect the congregation, uh, and we've liberated them from adherence to random verses of scripture yeah uh, yeah yeah good yeah yeah no, thank you that's very helpful thank you very much brendan uh, brendan brendan yeah. could i just chip in of course just, just picking up something from what mervyn said that i think perhaps is of interest when we come to the discussion later is just what is theology and and what this whole idea that we all benefit from some trickle down thing from those who are serious theologians somehow being the source of the truth uh, and we somehow at the bottom you know kind of pick up a little bit of this that isn't the method of jesus he wasn't somebody who who did it that way at all he started uh, at the bottom didn't he in the, yes. uh, the lowliest people uh, mm. and believed that they were going to be just as rich a source of truth uh, uh, than, than than people who are much more academic and able and, and and there's an interesting point there i think we might follow up on yeah thank you thanks very much gordon yeah thank you okay martin can can we hand over to you at this point martin from wake wakefield um hi, um, hi. i've got two i've got two churches in wakefield uh st george's which is on an urban priority area estate and st james which is just half a mile out of uh, the city of Wakefield in WF1. Uh, they're quite different to other parishes and I'm vicar of both. We've uh, got a ministry team that was here when I first came and we've got some new recruits since because I've been here for nine years now. Um, we have lay readers and pastoral ministers and we also have another SSM priest and we've had a curate and we're getting another curate. We have seven different house group leaders. We do parish vision days every year and we go away on a parish weekend every year so it's quite an active church and we have a lot going on and when we started JSP um, at first I was looking at it just as another course because my church uh, the, the congregations are very eager to do things to do vision days lists new courses new new material and I thought oh, I need some more material and I just looked at it in that way I must say that it is more than just a course. The programme is something that really helped us as churches to do a culture shift. And we really appreciated JSP for that because it wasn't a new list of things to do. It was about a new way to be. And the Sundays uh, for starters, we used the 15 week programme and we started ours in September after after doing some an intensive weekend and then we did every Sunday from September leading up to Christmas and that was a time of year to do it and as we looked at it in our Sunday program it was actually using the small groups during the week that really helped us because it opened up those conversations about why we do things and how we do things one of the things that I was concerned about our church was that when I first came here, I'd started a food bank uh, because I was having to give out so much food in my urban uh, priority area estate from the vicarage door. And we started a food bank. And after a while, people from church, the, the quite middle class people from church were, were getting very involved and being very professional in the way that they were doing it, that we were actually losing sight of our hospitality and of being like Jesus. And it was more like we were giving food, you know, we, you know when it, we ran a lunch club along with the food bank, but it was something like an old fashioned soup kitchen in a way. It was, we were giving to others rather than sharing with others and being with others. And in the small groups, we were able to really open that up and talk about it. And that's why I was talking about hospitality and cake. It, JSP just, I just remember we were just giving out food in the community all the time and just thinking about more ways in which we could not just give out, but share out and be and be with people in the community and be among people in the community. And the other thing that really benefited us was looking at the way in which we approach our work with children. And it, 
it was a way of looking at the children's work uh, in the other church that I have, uh, St. James Church. It was more traditional and we didn't really have many children. And every time we did things, it was about doing something for people's grandchildren, doing something for children. And JSP really enabled us to look at ways in which we could do things with children and be with them, be, be among them. And just opened up our fun days and events that we did with children to, to being with them rather than doing for them and letting them be with us. Uh, so it's very much about discipleship and culture change and being and being among. And there was a real sense of joy and people, we've been doing JSP now for a number of years and people in our church really enjoyed the culture shift that JSP brought to us uh, and talk about it as something, it, not just a course that we once did, but something that we became. Um, so we still have our posters up and our Jesus shaped people things. We still talk about it, we still do refreshers. There's more programs that you can follow after the 15 week program. There's other things that you can do. Uh, so we still, our home groups still tap into them and we still carry on with them so that we still carry on with, we are a Jesus shaped people church, not a church that did a Jesus shaped people course. Okay. That's brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Can I also ask you then, if you had to summarize in a sentence, the impact that you know, becoming more, more a more Jesus-shaped uh, church. Um, what, what, what would the, what would the key differences be? What would be the big things that have changed that culture change that you described? You had to say, summarize it in a sentence. Yeah, I, I'd say it was it was to be among rather than to do, rather yeah. than to do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we could just have a, a, a bit more of a chat around that, because I think you, you've probably gathered already that uh, we come from a variety of church traditions <laughs> from the various contributions so far. But maybe one of the features that, that, that goes across the board, though, is that, you know, our churches do tend to be quite professionalized and we are very much about doing uh, for rather than with. Uh, in um, in Bristol, I remember um, during a sort of interchurch mission thing, a, a church that I had something to do with had had on their website pictures of all their leaders and their profiles, and every single one of them had an extremely high-powered type job: a senior this, consultant of that, executive to this. I mean, you know, really, it's probably six-figure salary people. So I, I said to one of them, I said, if one of your leaders was a cleaner, would you feature that person on your website? Uh, it didn't go down very well. <laughs> but we can, we can, I suppose we can develop this big blind spot. And, you know, quite often the people missing in our churches are the cleaners, aren't they? Are they? There's, and there's a lot of them. They are the, the drivers and the delivery people. And the, the, the nobodies, for want of a better word. And I suppose what what drew me to JSB in particular is its emphasis on the whole church and you know the whole you know all of the community, which you know in most places where we live we'll find uh, folk who are marginalised and their voices are are heard. Maybe just for a few minutes. I mean, maybe from our panel, we can have one or two questions around that. What what are the what are the biggest barriers? Um, to churches, what are the biggest barriers to stop us being truly inclusive when it comes to people who are on the margins and on the outside? In my last congregation, we had a lot of people who were, who were barely literate. It's no good saying to them, read a book. Um, you, know, you, had to, you, you had to think creatively about how they could take their proper place in the congregation and in the church and their voice heard. But I'm just wondering from the panel, maybe, if you've got stories or the illustrations or anyone who's anyone who's watching at the moment who'd like to contribute uh, or ask or ask make a point or ask a question uh, around that. How do we how do we break those 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 barriers down? How how can we be a whole church discipleship church that's Jesus shaped? Um, can I can I dump, jump in here, Brendan? Of course, Brendan. Um, 
one of the group I was working with who had come through the CAP um, debt centre route, exactly your problem, literacy levels, not great, confidence levels, not great. So sitting and then me being the professional who knows yeah. the answer and imparting information wasn't going to be the solution. Um, what I did was I got uh, plain wallpaper, you know, the lining paper, length of that on a table and a bunch of Sharpies. Um, I did find one of the group who, who was confident to read. And when we looked at the parable of the sower, this, uh, this is how we sort of addressed that story. She would read the story. I would make very bad drawings of different bits of the parable as it's being read and then say to them so what was going on here and then write down what they fed back what had they had heard how had they interpreted this and then just sort of let them guide how the explanation of how they needed to be came from that and I've got this series of rolls of paper which is all of their information that they fed back how they heard what the parable was saying to them um, and it, be it becomes very empowering for people who aren't usually listened to or heard. Yeah. And it's, yeah, to be honest, it is fun. And I did it with the youth group as well for the same sort of reason. Um, so it then gets away from the professionalism that you've talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, you can stop them heading into heresy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's a very simple way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very helpful, Graham. And um, I, I, yeah, the, in the in the whole realm of significance, that's the, the you know I think you, what you did there highlights that. I mean, one of the things I used to do, you know, in previous congregations is is, is to mark Workers Memorial Day. You know, and some of the some of the lowest paid and least significant people often have the most dangerous jobs. It's a TUC initiative where you that that. Um, uh, remembers and highlights people who've died or been injured in their place of work so i could you know we'd get a, a, like a taxi driver and a, a bus driver well, a taxi driver is a pretty dangerous job actually if you work at night you don't know who's getting in there or if you're a bus driver you're often uh, um, subject to um, attack and abuse but, you know we'd, we'd get them up and talking about things that happened and people have been injured and, and the rest of it i think it's the, it's that area of significance it's quite a blind spot i find in, in the realm of church, whatever the actual background of the church quite often is. Um, that was a, a way, I think, of, of helping people recognize that, you know, their, their, their contribution to, to the community is, is important and they matter. Yeah, Gordon. Just a quick here that mm. I think one of the most um, lovely things that's happened to me through Jesus Shape People is where clergy and church leaders have actually found a whole new kind of level of, of assurance and confidence in, in Jesus and started to really believe again in him. Yeah. And that, that whole experience then uh, leads them to recognize that they can believe in their people again. And they, they can see that their lowliest people, the ones on the margins of their church life, have actually got a rich contribution to make. Yeah. And it's often in leadership of a church that you need to then you need to believe that you can actually start to see an, a change of culture in that leader, mm. whether they're clergy or lay, whoever it is. It often it's a crucial thing and it's a joy beyond measure when people who've actually lost their confidence in leadership and in ministry and so on rediscover it because they find it, they find the Jesus way, something that re-sparks all that on. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gordon. Okay. Well, it's, it's 10 to, we're going to move on to the uh, next section in a minute, but before the end, we'll come back to the whole area of discipleship and COVID. I mean, clearly a lot of churches are going to be impacted by the legacy. I mean, don't, don't in the ordained world, if you want of a better world, word, um, we're going to see, a lot of people spread more thinly uh, and there's, there's, you know there's going to be a legacy there that we're all going to have to inherit and you know and perhaps um, the method and approach of JSP and other things too can, you, you know can help to unlock maybe the way that 
you know, clericalism has sometimes um, held us back and, uh, and held us back from from discipleship. But anyway, we need to move on at this point and um, think about um, the plight of young people and, uh, and children. I, there's a lot of evidence, I think, that suggests they've been the least um, catered for during the lockdown and shutdown of churches. That's why it's good that we've got um, Dawn Savage, our um, young people and children's uh, national advisor, with us today to talk about that. Uh, and we can put some questions to Dawn um, after. I'm sure she's going to throw up some very interesting uh, things for us because there's, there's no doubt if we're thinking about people on the edges and the margins and the, the least um, at the moment, it seems that um, they are certainly in that category. So Dawn, um, I will over to you. I will make you... Um, I already am. Where have you? Ah, oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> right, I already am. <clears throat> I have uh, host you. I already am. Oh, you're right. Oh, great. I am already. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Uh, I have the job this afternoon to hopefully prod you and poke you and challenge you and hopefully reaffirm you in your look at young people today. So I have been given the title, where have all the young people gone? And I've actually written it down because sometimes I tend to get a little bit animated and a little bit excited about all of this stuff. So I've, I've been very calm. Gordon will be very impressed, I'm very calm. <laughs> so young people today, unfortunately have been dubbed the, the COVID generation, uh, the long-term impact on education and employment and mental health still very much unknown. But one thing is certain, uh, the pandemic will be felt for generations after this one. Our children and young people have been coping with cancellation of exams uh, and a fight for those who are taking BTEC exams to even get an answer. Are they taking exams? Are they not taking exams? And that still is carrying on this year as well. The algorithm mess ups of results, which led to a campaign, which led to the government making a U-turn and saying sorry, but the damage had already been done and many young people didn't get their first choice of university places. They've lost good endings, no leavers balls, no leavers services, no hugs, goodbyes. They've lost jobs. In fact, uh, under 25s are twice as likely to have lost their job as over 25s. And more than half of that number have lost their working hours. They've actually been cut in half. The DWP has done things like do the kickstart kick scheme and invest in apprenticeships, but is this too little, too late? They've lost their education. Stats have shown that pupils in private schools were five times more likely to have four or more online lessons during lockdown 1.0 than students from state schools. Four in 10 pupils are still not getting the same number of school hours as they did before lockdown. In fact, there was some report that I'd seen that basically said they're six months behind in learning. And in key stage one, that, that even extends to a year behind in, in terms of learning. We've seen the, disp the dispro uh, disproportionate effect of COVID on the poor, digital poverty, both in rural and inner city settings, those from disadvantaged back backgrounds, needed in feeding, uh, always one paycheck away from poverty. There was a story that I read that one school was giving 13,000 pounds from the government, which equated to about 21 pound extra per pupil, um, but they needed to, to buy laptops for 30 students, which essentially cost 8,000 pounds. So the, uh, the Department of Education has given out 58 million pounds to, to cover the whole of the school system in, in England. We've seen a rise in poor mental health, increase in, in anxiety, eating disorders and depression, nursing and counselling services are completely saturated and unable to cope with the, the pandemic. Online mental health services like Cooth have, ha have had up to 4,000 visits per day. Demand for the services has increased. Um, stats are showing some something like 13% up on self-harm, 20% up on suicidal thoughts. Isolation triggers mental health issues in both adults and definitely in children and young people. And younger adults were more likely to report that they have depressive symptoms. 
and suicidal thoughts. They have lost people, they have lost connection, they have lost freedom. Where does their resilience come from? And my question to you is how have we as a church come alongside and been with our children and young people? I know many children and youth workers have been furloughed in this season and many more have found their jobs redundant with churches just being able to, not being able to stretch their finances. Yet some churches have recognized the importance of this ministry and have managed to employ new children and youth workers during lockdown, which is amazing. I heard a great quote recently, being a youth worker is enabling young people to live in God's goodness. Where can we listen to our children and young people? How can we help them lament in this season? And how can we move ourselves from a lament to gratitude for all that God is doing in this season? I listened to a great lecture last night. I'll put the details in the chat later because it was amazing about how we can be with our young people on online. And Martin touched on this beautifully earlier on. There is so much worry about being zoomed out or on screens too much. Yet, when I look at my own children, they jump from screen to screen and would do for hours unless I intervened. I wonder if this is sometimes an excuse that us adults put there. Zoom is hard, definitely. Jesus spent 9% of his time working with people, 1% working for people, and 90% of his time being with people. Yet much of our children and youth ministry is spent working for our children and young people. So my questions for you are, maybe we are losing our children and young people because we have spent our time working for them and not enough time being with them. Graham, I love your story about being with the young people. That was, that was fabulous. Maybe we are losing them because their grief is so deep and so painful that they are just mad at God and not us. Maybe we are losing them because we haven't provided a space where they can just talk and be listened to. Maybe we're losing them because life just sucks for them at the minute. And even getting out of bed in the morning is painful in a world that doesn't see them anymore. Do you say people give church as a chance to be with children and young people and listen to what God is saying through them and in them in a real, very real way. They've done so properly and intentionally, not as an add-on, so that we can do adult ministry uninterrupted by the wonderings of a five-year-old or the questioning of a 13-year-old. It can be an amazing gift. If we are wanting to change the way that we do church, and reach out to our communities, why would we not want to hear from the generation that has been the most impacted as a result of the pandemic? And I don't mean giving them a craft to do and only listening if they come up with an idea that we as adults deem appropriate to investigate further. We have written some intergenerational materials to help us come together and listen to what God is saying to all generations at the same time. I don't know of any other place where a five-year-old can sit beside a 90-year-old and chat about what God is saying to them. How amazing and rich is that? If we are really wanting to hear what God, where God wants to move us, let's do it together. Let's listen to one another, learn from one another, and emerge from the pandemic a stronger and healthier church as a result. That's my little speech. I managed it. <laughs> We've done a promotional video that kind of highlights the need for, in this season, for intergenerational ministry. So I'm going to share my screen and um, hopefully you'll be able to see that in a moment or two. It'll come up in a second. Just loading. I have very slow internet at the moment as I have three children on the internet at the same time. <laughs> there we go.
oh, it'll eventually get there. <laughs> Here we go. The season that we are in has given us the chance to reshape church. So many of us miss our church buildings and the magnificent interiors. And we all miss being with our church family in person, worshipping all together. A lot of our churches have moved to online services. We do Zoom coffees, YouTube sermons, midweek Bible studies on Teams. But actually some people have found it really hard to connect, especially our children, families and young people. Our families have been busy during this time. Busy eating. Busy growing. Busy living. Busy laughing. Busy loving. But in all this busyness, we have lost connection with our own church family. And sometimes reconnecting can be hard. During the pandemic, things have been difficult. We have lost many people. We have lost many things. We have had to learn new things. We have had to relearn old things. But God and his word never changes and has been a comfort to many of us in this season. But what if God is asking us as a church to walk down a different path? What if he is asking us to start a new adventure? Here at Jesus Shaped People, we have written a new course that asks just that question. What is God saying to us during this season? It gives us time to stop and reflect as a church family and to lean in and to listen to God's still small voice amidst the storm of the pandemic. The course gives us chance as a church to listen to the whole family and hear what God is saying from the youngest member to the oldest. The course itself is seven weeks long. It has a new intergenerational material so we can learn as a big family. Each week you will watch a video and then there are six questions that will help you explore and listen to what God is saying to you in this season. The questions are very interactive and immersive and will engage the whole family. So I wonder, what is God saying to you? Why don't you get in touch with us and find out more? The whole course is free and we are happy to chat to you to see how this would best fit your own church family. Hopefully I'm just going to stop sharing. There we go. I'll hand back over to Brendan. Thank, uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Dawn. Thank you. <clears throat> Why don't we? I've got a question down here, which I was going to put to the panel. I think we can tie it in with what Dawn was talking about there. So the, the question is, how might whole church discipleship look like in in this COVID and now, hopefully, post COVID era? Even if we get over it, there is going. To, I think there's, there's going to be a legacy. Um, Dawn, Dawn, Dawn spoke there about something we've been we've been looking at, and which I've got some experience of. It's not the be all and end all, but the, this whole idea of intergenerational worship, where different generations worship and learn together, e even though they might be learning and seeing things at different levels, they are collectively doing something uh, together, which I, I, I find uh, very profound. I, I like the. Um, <clears throat> the the Shrek analysis. You're probably familiar with the, the the film Shrek, where an adult can be easily entertained by that film, and so can a child. But they will watch it differently. There'll be things that are uh, are said and done in the film which will be particularly pertinent to to, to different generations. It, it, some children may not get one or two jokes in the in the film um, Shrek. So we've been looking at that. So maybe I could turn to the panel to uh, Martin. Uh, Mervyn and Graham to start off with and you know how you see whole church discipleship working in in this situation and and and, and could and do you see uh, opportunities for the kind of thing that Dawn was talking about that talking about just then you know i.e you know intergenerational ministry and work and in maybe in ways that hasn't been done before 
So, I mean, Graham, have you got a thought or a, a reflection on that? The, the way my thinking is is at the moment with the specifics of St Barnabas is, you know, our monthly all-age worship service is uh, probably going to be an anachronism. <laughs> that idea that you, you do a specific service style for um, families that will engage really has got to challenge us to say, if we are realistic about learning together then actually it's not about crafts <laughs> but how do we do each of our services like that and the reality for where I am is there will still be a core who will want their typical Eucharistic service but we'd started before Covid a, a second service on a Sunday morning that was deliberately heading this way to be that more inclusive service i think that is where we need to focus now moving forward um, and those sort of other divisions uh, are going to have to just disappear great yeah thank you Graham. yeah we could be, i'd like to come back to that in a minute martin uh, martin what's how do you yeah. how do you see it unfolding <laughs> yeah I, I think it's just going with the developments that that we're thankful that have happened during this time um uh, you know uh, doing things like the zoom services or facebook live streaming services and things that many of us have learned to do i would never have had the nerve to do that and i didn't want to do that but now that we're doing them because we've got people that are followers of those that, that have never been to church and some of them can't come to church but for health reasons you know we thought it might reach out to the younger people but it's actually it's it's actually reached out to some older people that had stopped coming to church because they couldn't come anymore on a sunday morning so i think we're going to have to carry them on and, and see the real benefit in in reaching out to people in that way and the confidence that it's given to some of the young people that maybe have been involved in youth fellowship and things in the past but in their early 20s, maybe trying to find their space in church, were able to find things to do when some of the over 70s couldn't do things um, in the early, in the first lockdown. Um, they started picking up some of those jobs. So it's to keep them on now and to, and to keep them in, in church life and part of things and learn from them. It's, you know, we've had a, a new young chap who's come back from university who's joined our PCC and on, on our Zoom and is, is really uh, speaking out with um, that youthful enthusiasm um, at our meetings and, and it's to kind of hone that and to, to use it. Um, and, and to make make something of it, not to just think, oh, well, it's all going to end and we'll go back to normal soon, but to actually enjoy some of these bonuses that we're having. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Um, Mervyn. Yes. Um, one of the things that, that has happened uh, over, over COVID um, is that uh, we, we're very worried about the young people not getting Sunday school. And uh, we found out almost accidentally that two of the younger teenagers have been running Sunday school and they've had 100 percent attendance for an hour at a time. Uh, and we have no idea what's going on there because we're too old. And uh, uh, technology that's been too difficult for us, they have just overcome. And we found they've been taking little bags of things round and, and putting them outside people's doors um, so that they could all do the same activity at the same time. Uh, really nice. And getting away from putting Jesus and God into the same category as Father Christmas and the Tooth Fairy. That is, we tell children things that turn out not to be true, like God will save you from harm, for instance. Anything you want, you ask God for it, you get it. Um, and, and, you know, of, of course, children discard that when, when they grow up. But here we've got two children who are engaging a wide range of children who we were not engaging with before COVID um, because they're being allowed to get on with it under loose adult supervision. Um, 
I, I think that uh, we're going to come back very different. I think we might come back with two parallel activities on a Sunday morning, one a church service and the other one uh, for people who really enjoy cafe style worship. You know, to be able to go and get a coffee in the middle and, and uh, uh, stand around a table and make something or, you know, and that might be a whole family or it might be uh, children with a leader or it might be just people who don't want to sit down for an hour. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we're going to be very different at the end, but I don't want to preempt the outcome of the discussion groups, which we would not have had had it not been for G JSP because mm -hmm. discussion groups didn't really happen. Because there were right answers, you know, before, yeah. before JSP, yeah. there were right answers. Yeah. And, uh, One or two somebody, people else, somebody else knew what their right answer was, so you wouldn't speak up because you were going to be correct. Yeah, just on a thought on this, um, this whole area of Sunday school and, uh, uh, um, and young people's groups. I mean, clearly young people and children are always going to need their own spaces. But it, it strikes me, and I found this increasingly, and may, maybe though, I mean, I'm not in charge of a congregation at the moment, I'm helping one, but I'm not kind of, I'm not the main, the main leader, they, we don't have one. But it struck me in more recent years that when families did come along to church, who had never been to church, never had any experience of it whatsoever, I think they found the whole concept of their, if they brought children along with them, or the chances are the children brought them, and they were then hived off somewhere else. It, it seemed like a rather odd thing if you've got no experience of, 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 of church at all, a rather, you know, a rather peculiar practice in, in, in some ways to people who aren't used to it. Um, I'm just wondering, given that, that we do the comments we've just had, whether, you know, maybe we're being nudged in that direction to actually discover new ways of actually you know doing church and worshiping together across the generations and 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 you know refocusing on this the whole church um emphasis yeah yeah maybe, just add yeah. very shortly um sunday schools uh started off being in the afternoon on sunday uh, yeah. so that the parents can get the children out of the house and have sex without yes, right. yes. and uh, <laughs> youth clubs used to happen so that uh, young people of opposite sexes could meet and uh, and in a in a respectable atmosphere uh, that their parents respected and uh, and were able to, to to get courting and to do the sort of things that teenagers do together and the yeah. church has lost that because it's been run by people who've forgotten about sex okay. and actually this is a most powerful motivator if only we could get um uh, back to that excitement. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. My, you, you, my mother-in-law used to go on about that. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, in, I mean, in Bristol, where I'm based, for example, when I went to a, uh, I took a church on there in uh, in 2001, and the the first thing the secretary said to me was, "Well, we used to have hundreds of kids in the Sunday school around here, and look at us now." <clears throat> and what I discovered, of course, was the major employer in, the, in South Bristol was the Wills Company, that's the tobacco firm, and you could not get a job there unless you had a Sunday school certificate. So guess what? And they paid the best salaries, best working conditions. Guess what? Parents made darn sure that their child was in Sunday school every single week and got that certificate so that they get a job down at Wills. So, yes. Uh, that that yeah it, there were <laughs> there were there's often stories behind some of these traditions aren't there as uh, Mervyn's reminded us as well of another one. Um, okay, right, we're moving towards the end, but there's a couple of other sort of questions I really wanted to um, get in um, before we go. Um, I suppose it's around this looking for some prof so, 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 some prophecies here. <laughs> I remember years ago I was in um, I was in Istanbul in the summer. It was the height of the summer. It must have been 95 degrees. It was so hot, and I had a I was sort of backpacking. I had a rucksack on. I was aware of this guy across the street watching me, and uh, he he shout he shouted out across the street. He he said, "Efendim, kush geliyor?" Which, if you speak any, if you speak a little bit Turkish, means, "Sir, winter is coming." <laughs> He said that because 
he wanted me to sell he wanted to sell me a leather jacket <laughs> it was the last thing i was i was uh, i was thinking of in the middle of august walking along in, in 95 degrees heat um uh, well, he was right. Winter did come. And I didn't buy a jacket. Perhaps I should have. Um, nobody saw this coming, this whole thing. What I'd like to hear from Graham and Martine and Gordon and, uh, and Dawn and, and Mervyn again in a, in a minute. What, what, what is going to be the legacy and what is the maybe two or three bullet points that we can take away with us today that you feel um, are going to be important? For, for whole church discipleship in the, it, it, with what's coming next. I, I know none of us quite know, but I think there's going to be some, some more significant changes. So, um, Graham, maybe I could ask you that first. What, what, what is going to, what's going to be the legacy? What's coming next? We know winter's, summer's coming and winter will come, but what's coming next in this whole thing for the world of church? Clergy are, are being asked to, to, to deliver more with less, I think, and that's getting them down, and that's perfectly understandable. What, what, what are the maybe two or three key things which you know which we can link to JSP, which you've done and got experience with, which would be good to take into the into the next chapter with whatever lies in store? Um, Graham, what, what do you I, think? Yeah, I think um, it's already been said that we 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 are stuck with dual ways of engaging with worship. I think that that cat is out the bag and actually yep. we need to embrace it. Um, you know, that's another module at Theology College on being a TV presenter that none of us thought we would ever have to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and having watched, especially early days, watched a lot of um, online worship to get inspiration for how to do ours. Um, you know, we all need some training in this desperately, mm. I think. Um I think the key thing from JSP is how do we keep those groups that naturally coalesced from the midweek part of JSP? How do we keep those going and how do we engage them in a in a very practical way to make change and actually live out what it means to be a follower of Jesus in a very mm -hmm. practical way? And it's not just about Sunday. You know, so for us very much is let my, my group of teens are really keen to keep that snick it clean going. Yes, they like eating pizza together. Yes, they are all mates together. But it's something that they can be genuinely proud of to be involved with. And how do we, yeah, how does what we believe in our head become very practical as a way of, showing the community around us that we that some we've got a motivation that drives us to be this giving in a, in a society that is going to be very wary of being in other people's company yeah. because they might be disease carriers yeah it's getting over that legacy of fear of the other that is only going to become about through seeing community and communities work together yes we have. I think that's that's where we're heading yeah yeah and, and it will and sunday won't become the big focus i think yes it will need to still be delivered but what do we do during the week how does our faith practically affect us yeah yeah and then those groups will draw others in through their connections and that sort of organic growth is what we're going to see yeah um yeah yeah so if I was to summarise that comment in a prayer, Graham, I think we'd be praying, Lord, give us a spirit of creativity. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mart Martine, what, what's 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 coming next? <laughs> yeah. So one of the another blessing during this time has been uh, the growth of people that we are connected with. Um, through through the different multi-generational things that we've had to hand. One of the lovely things that, that's happened to us is we've invited, we've got different church WhatsApp groups, but we also have the messy church WhatsApp group. And every time someone's uh, approached me for a baptism inquiry and I've not been able to, they've not been able to have their usual baptism, I have invited them to join the messy church WhatsApp group. 
The Mercy Church WhatsApp group seems to be active more than we expected. People are talking to each other on a daily basis. We're talking about God. We're praying with each other on a daily basis through the Mercy Church WhatsApp. And the communication is brilliant. Same with the church WhatsApps. Same with the home groups that are meeting on evenings uh, via Zoom. And we've got more people doing that. So in terms of people in, in, JS, in the JSB programme, I feel that we are connecting with people and we've done different things. We did a Christmas cheer project. We did things with our food bank, with different things to connect with people. The teaching's also improving. I've got people doing daily prayer and joining on Facebook or Zoom daily prayer that weren't even doing daily prayer before, that just did Sundays. They're now doing Zoom house group, daily prayer, all sorts of things, praying on WhatsApp, reading things. So, so the teaching's really growing. So I think moving into the future, moving back into church is now about discipleship and development for these new people. And that's about team building, team building of the church family, bringing the church WhatsApp messy church groups into the church family and building them to be part of the team, building on the existing ministry teams and uh, refiring them and, and equipping them and discipling the church ministry teams, rebuilding the blocks uh, that we already have because everyone's slumped a bit after the winter and after Christmas. And also the prayer, you know, never to underestimate the power of prayer. And this is now the time. We're, we're about to go into a new phase with new hope. So this is the time now to really get praying. And, yeah. and we want that prophetic challenge to come. So it is building on the blocks. We know that they're there and, and not underestimate them because there, there's so much hope. But get praying. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's really helpful, Martin. Yeah. And I think churches have had the technology issue imposed on them through COVID. And so, certainly JSP, we're very aware of that. We're interested to develop a smartphone app um, as well. And you know, clearly you've really highlighted a superb use of things like WhatsApp, which is so easy to use. And is a, is a you know, and it might be that the future discipleship, you know, and it means having me. me means having that 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 communication in somebody's pocket or handbag all the time it's um, amazing the way the way that it's worked when i think of a usual baptism family someone who didn't come to church would inquire about an infant baptism i'd uh, invite them to come to a sunday service i say come along to a sunday service fill in a form we'd invite them to come then to a baptism training session where you know we show them what's going to happen at the baptism and we try to encourage them to come to other church things and to messy church but they don't always come but by being part of this WhatsApp, they yeah. get lovely inspirational things every day that they yeah. get, to, you know, it's just really great. Yeah. And they are now in conversation. People are having conversations with me through the WhatsApp that wouldn't have normally dared to ring up the vicarage to ask, but they can ask me a little bit. Yeah, it's what people are comfortable with, isn't it? It's what they used to. That's great. Thank you. Well. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, thank you. Uh, Mervyn, in a nutshell, what's going to happen next and what's our discipleship response to it? OK, first of all, we're all going to change from WhatsApp to Signal because it's run by a non-profit instead of Facebook. <laughs> um, the thing that's been really successful for us, and I've only just thought about this, is when Gordon emphasised the teams thing, the tapping people on the shoulder and saying, look, this is something that you could do, and then trusting them to do it. Uh, but it means decentralising power. And yeah, one yeah, of the advantages yeah. that we have as a church is that we do not have a minister, who, uh, a professional, who has oversight of the church. It's a church run by amateurs. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we have a leadership team, which is, which is chaired by a minister, but it's not, it's not the minister in charge of the church and so we've we've had to get people to do things and we've got loads of people who've run online services who have no qualifications to in in the methodist church at all about running services and they've done wonderful splendid jobs innovative and exciting and different um we've been very fortunate thank you yeah thank you yeah thank you that's really helpful yeah yeah it, we, we like to talk about um, empowering, empowerment in church, but of course, to empower somebody, somebody else has to lose power, which is a, a pretty uh, crucial, crucial point. Um, Dawn, 
what's going to happen next? And then Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'll just uh, I'll just kind of um, highlight a little bit of what Mervyn and Martine have already said. Uh, my question is, where are you going to invest your time? Mervyn's talked about um, the divulging of power from from the top. We have so many people around us that are thoroughly capable. And Martine's talked about team building as well. Uh, part of youth work is asking that question. I need your help, but not I need your help to move tables and chairs, but I need your help because only you have the gift and skills to do this particular thing. It's about knowing those people around you and how are we going to change and evolve. And I also controversially hope that we lose the word Sunday school because it should not be instructional. It should be a place where kids get to experience who God is for them and not necessarily a place where we as adults impart our knowledge of God onto children. It's a bit controversial mm -hmm. at the end. Oh, oh, interesting, yeah. Okay, just before we hear from Gordon, Dale made an interesting point here to say, you know, what, what we'd like to ask is if we're able to have a hybrid model of services on a Sunday, i.e. a person um, via Zoom or, and other virtual platforms, how do we clearly arrange our patterns for worship? I have three churches pre-COVID, four services a Sunday, adding in a service by Zoom is like adding another church in the mix. Unfortunately, my congregations would not necessarily attend church unless it is a Sunday. Wow, yeah, that's a challenge. And I, I suppose the, the, the prayer for that situation is this culture change and getting away from, I suppose, describing, describing church, if we say we're meeting on Tuesdays or Wednesdays or whenever, um, I'm going to church. We're doing it's, it's church on Tuesday. It's church on Monday. It's church Saturday morning. It's, I mean that that's a tough call, and I don't think there's any simple answer to that one at all, is there? Um, and I think you know, I probably a lot of clergy and church leaders are gonna are gonna find themselves in that that same challenge as um, as Dale. Yeah. I was uh, having a conversation with a, a colleague. Um, from Essex yesterday evening about this exactly. He has done a very specific online service each week. And he has come to the point where he's recognized that actually he can't stop that running because he's engaging with people who are in numbers that are more than his congregation, outside of his congregation who would never go to his church. And he's now sort of working through exactly what's probably going through Dale's head is, how do I tell someone that they're not getting their service? <laughs> because I can't do everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it fits in with um, what May Mervyn has just said about, we need to empower the laity a lot more and not impose on them so many church based rules and restrictions about who can and can't do some of this. Yep. Now, I know that's very controversial as an Anglican, and I know what my restrictions are, but actually, as church, we have to find a way to release the energy that is in the laity yeah. to allow us to get round Dale's problem. Yeah, and that, that's a debate. Problem. Yeah, and that debate's been going on, of course, a long time, but maybe that maybe COVID... The whole COVID, it, it, it's forced the issue, hasn't it? Like the technology. Um, time's just about be, gone. I was time. just going to say, Mervyn will be pleased to hear I trained as a Methodist local preacher. So I do understand the concept of the restrictions that our denominations uh, have. <laughs> we, you're right, we do need, this has got to be pushed forward and say something has got to change. Um, yeah. Or the yeah. it, leaders it, are going to break. Yeah, and it's being imposed, isn't it? And I, I think our attitude towards buildings and what they're all about is, you know, to click. there's so there's so many other things we could have we could have spoken about. What I'm going to suggest is I'm going to give Gordon the last word because um, Gordon is <laughs> clearly the, the person who can speak about JSP uh, the most authoritatively because he um, the Lord gave it to him and he's developed it. And, uh, and I'm going to give him the final word, Gordon, on what's going to, what's, what's going to happen next and how JSP can happen. Then maybe, Gordon, you could, you could close in prayer for us. Would that be okay? Yeah, no pressure, goodness me. No pressure. No, I, thought, let's, let, I think you should have the last word. Well, I, I think I, I agree with such a lot that people have said, you know, and, and it's obviously right that we're kind of are working towards, you know, the way forward. And, and to the idea that you can suddenly kind of present that 
and be and be con convicted by it. Of course, there are strands that we can see emerging. But I think if there's one strand that we haven't perhaps talked about, that we need to kind of, um, you know, kind of not lose sight of, is that God is actually not just concerned to keep his church on the go. He's actually concerned with the whole universe that he's made and he delights in it. And he expects that we as, as those who follow Jesus will be those who won't just be concerned about our own survival, but we're concerned for the whole thing of God's world. And, and that therefore we need to have a greater partnership with others who find who we can find common cause with in those areas. And, and they may or may not be people of faith, but, but they may well be those with whom we share such a lot. And finding the links and working with people who are, uh, are not just, as it were, coming to our church or even feel much a loyalty towards it, but they do share with us a massive concern for values that are to do with people um, where we live in a world where there's so much division and where, where there are huge numbers of people who feel left out or feel, you know, where we've created a, a world that's based on wealth and prosperity for the few and not for the many. So all of, all of that, you know, has got to be a powerful thrust for us. We're concerned about the ecological damage that we've been doing by the greed that we've been about. And, and indeed, I, I really would recommend that if people haven't already looked at Stay Alert to the Spirit, the sort of ideas that I'm expressing are kind of well rehearsed in that programme. Uh, and you can be looking for ways in which you can find stimulus towards that kind of process, really. So I just, I just kind of urge us to end with a, a sort of sense of something much bigger almost and that the church needs to kind of move out of its i mean the big question for me during this whole period is uh, is the church locked out or was it locked in i mean the problem was maybe often was that we were locked into where we were and the idea that we've been locked out is actually released as or can be and we need to allow that to continue and not be stifled. And the values that we might have spotted during this period at various points don't lose them. I, I remember standing in the supermarket queue talking to all kinds of people as we waited to be let in. And they were telling me all kinds of things that they were convicted about during that period. Let's listen again to what God is saying, often through very lowly people and realize again the need to, uh, you know, kind of be, embrace the things that are of God, really. Uh, and they may not always just be to do with the survival of the church. Shall we pray? Thank yeah. you very much, Gordon. Yeah, great, a good, a good place, a uh, good place to end. And of course, you can access uh, Stay Alert to the Spirit on our, via our website. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gordon. If you could pray. Yeah. Thanks be to you, our Lord Jesus Christ, for all that you have done for us, for stepping into our world so that we can step into yours. Lord Jesus, we long to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and to follow you more nearly in these days and these days to come reinvigorate us lord by your spirit for this we pray today in jesus name amen amen thank you gordon thank you gordon thank you martin thank grand thank you mervyn and uh, dawn and everyone who's joined uh, with us today thank you so much i'm sorry if we didn't cover all the ground you would have liked us to but Time does not always allow, but um, please visit our website and get in touch and we'll be very happy to answer any other sort of more detailed questions about any of our resources or uh, other things you'd like to know. Um, just get in touch. There's all the contact information on our website, but we'll say uh, bye for now. And thank you very much to Hard Edge for hosting us and uh, for doing all the tech. Bye.